FBI informants before the committee. From December 22, 1975, we're going to show you a clip of Klu a Ku Klux Klan FBI informant by the name of Thomas Rowe. He described how he be participated in beatings of civil rights activists during the Freedom Riders movement in Birmingham, Alabama. Let's watch. Right. In connection with the Freedom Riders incident that you mentioned, uh, did you inform the FBI about planned violence prior to that incident? Sir, I gave the uh, FBI information pertaining to the Freedom Riders assault approximately three weeks before it occurred. And what did you tell him? I stated to him that I had been contacted by a Birmingham City detective who in turn wanted me to meet with a uh, high-ranking officer of the Birmingham Police Department to set a reception for the Freedom Riders. You mean the Birmingham policeman set up the beating of the Freedom Riders and you told the FBI that? That's correct, sir. Uh, and then were they beaten? They were beaten very badly, yes. And did the Birmingham police give you the time that they promised to give you to perform the beat? Yes, sir. We were promised uh, 15 minutes with absolutely no intervention from any police officer whatsoever. Uh, the information was passed on to the Bureau. They, we had our 15 minutes. Approximately 15 minutes after the Freedom Riders uh, were attacked, uh, a police officer ran over to me and stated, God damn it, God damn it, get out of here, get them out of here. Your 15 minutes are up, we're sending the crew in. So, Fritz Schwartz, watching this, let me have you underscore for the public exactly what it is that we're hearing here. What I'm, I'm trying to understand is that we just heard testimony that the FBI and the Birmingham police colluded to allow people to come in and beat the Freedom Riders unaffected for 15 minutes before the authorities moved in. Is that, is that correct? Is that what we just heard? That's what you just heard, and that's what happened that day. We had two witnesses, Gary Thomas Rowe, who testified with a hood over his head that I'll tell you about in a minute, and a young woman who was a, in the Vietnam Veterans Against the War. Maybe she worked for that group, and she was an informer for the FBI. Now, again, our, our point was not you should not have any informers. Um, informers are a legitimate law enforcement tool. However, there was absolutely no process for deciding what, how and who you would pick as an informer. And as that story about um, knowing beatings of the Freedom Riders shows, the informers sometimes do some very bad things in order to maintain their credibility. Now, Roe uh, had come out into the public because he testified in a murder trial uh, against three Ku Klux Klan people who had murdered uh, Viola Leoso, a civil rights worker who was on a march in the south, maybe in Selma, uh, and she was shot by the three Ku Klux Klan people and killed um, and because she was riding in a car with two black young men. Um, so he had become public and uh, gone public and testified at the murder trial against the three, his three confederates in the Ku Klux Klan. With about half an hour to go before the hearing, he said to me, I can't appear on television. And we really wanted him on television because it was such a dramatic story. And under the rules of the Senate, a w at least then, a witness who didn't want to appear on television didn't have to appear on television. So I came up with the idea of putting a bag over his head and slits over his eyes and maybe for his mouth so that he could see and talk. I thought that was a pretty clever idea. So, uh, one of the assistants for Senator Tower, who was presiding that day, Frank Church was away, um, said, you, you did that in order to embarrass Senator Tower. Now, Senator Tower never said any such thing to me, and I think if he'd thought it, he would have said it. Uh, but um, I think it was a great idea, and it got this guy to testify, and it perhaps added a little bit of drama for having this person with a bag over his head giving that very dramatic testimony that you just played. So uh, again, to understand the FBI's motivation in this, they allowed the Ku Klux Klan to proceed with the beatings uh, so that this gentleman could maintain his anonymity in the midst of them and continue to serve as an informant. That would be their motivation, correct? 
Yeah, and it, it's it's not, you know, you can go back to World War II and when we broke the German code, um, we had to do some things, we and the British broke the German code, we had to do some things in order to maintain credibility and not to have the Germans know we'd broken their code and there's the story about how Churchill allowed the raid, uh, the German bombing raid to take place on Coventry because he was afraid that if suddenly they were to take people out of the town of Coventry because we'd broken the German code and knew the bombing was about to happen, it, it might have destroyed the uh, the uh, knowledge or revealed the knowledge that uh, the Americans and the British had broken the German code. So informers are inherently ambiguous uh, and our hearing was designed to bring that out, br to bring out that they do some pretty horrible things and that the, F that the FBI allowed a beating to go on is they didn't have to do that, by the way, to keep this guy's anonymity um, protected. Uh, they could have said, we've heard to the Birmingham police, you simply can't allow the beating of these Freedom Riders. Um, but th then there, our public policy point was, after having developed those facts, was to make some suggestions for improvements in how the FBI would authorize and then manage informants. Uh, Elliot Maxwell, uh, this hearing was chaired, as uh, Fritz Schwartz just said, by uh, the Republican Senator, Vice Chairman of the Committee, John Tower. We haven't had a chance to talk about him too much. Uh, since you, you worked for a senator on the Republican side, could you speak a little bit about John Tower and his approach to the work of this committee? You know, my, <clears throat> my own belief is that... Um, John Tower was picked as the vice chair as a, as a possible bulwark uh, against a much more liberal Frank Church and where he might take the committee. Is a matter uh, on the whole, I think Tower was um, reasonably supportive of the work. I think that that was um, an important part of why it was able to move forward, that he did not say, take a kind of absolutely obstructionist view of, of the committee. Um, but as I said earlier, as they, they, there was a great range of uh, ideological opinion on the Republican side. And Tower, Goldwater were on the right end of that, and would prob would would sort of, I think, corral the the committee to prevent it from going, maybe further than it it would otherwise. This is a big topic, I know, Mr. Schwartz. But if you could briefly tell us, because we haven't brought this element in, what was the level of cooperation from the Ford White House into the hearings? Well, um, uh, on on that subject, John Tower was extremely import, uh, extremely helpful in pushing for the documents. We had to get documents. I knew this from my experience in lawyer and private practice. If you don't have documents and you just have witnesses, you get stories, but you can't prove the real facts. Tower was greatly helpful on that. Uh, there came a time, uh, probably around in December when the atmosphere, particularly on our foreign work, changed a bit because a CIA station chief in Athens had been assassinated and obviously we had nothing to do with that and George H.W. Bush admitted we had nothing to do whatsoever with that. But it changed the atmosphere in the country a little bit. After that point on the foreign intelligence work, I think Tower was less cooperative than he'd been all the way into November. Uh, but in general, he was a good guy. I think Elliot had it just right. Um, yes, he may have been cautious, but I thought in the early parts of our work, uh, there wasn't much difference between John Tower and Frank Church or John Tower and Fritz Mondale. 
Um, and he was essential, I believe, to our winning and winning when we did in getting the documents. In response to the question about the, the White House, I think in general the White House position with respect to the committee was they wanted to be able to preempt the committee and therefore they had an activity led by the uh, Vice President Rockefeller. Um, and they thought perhaps that if the, their activity at looking at intelligence activities in response to these uh, the, the public uh, concern over them, that you could preempt the work of the church committee. And so there was some tension with the White House, and there is continually between Senate committees and, and the White House. But in that sense, there was a kind of, maybe we can manage our way out of this, uh, limit what the committee does, limit the documents or and access to people that would otherwise be available. But in the end, that just didn't work. Uh, we are about to show 45 minutes of this uh, segment of the Church Committee's work on FBI informants. Before we do, you referenced earlier that there was another informant by the name of Mary Jo Cook, and she represents the FBI's work uh, investigating people who protested the war in Vietnam. So we shouldn't, uh, we should not be remiss in in uh, talking about her. So who was she, and what did the committee want to learn from her? Well, you know, I remember her name. I remember her testifying. I know she was in the uh, working with the Vietnam veterans against the war, but I do not remember the specifics of her testimony. Uh, she obviously was good or, or useful, or we wouldn't have chosen to put her on as a witness. And can you talk in generally what you remember about the FBI's concerns about Vietnam protesters? Well, they, they, they um, believed FBI protesters were communist agents, and in that connection, Lyndon Johnson pushed them very hard to investigate the people who were against the war. Um, I, I, the Bureau probably would have done it anyway, but Johnson was a force that was pushing the Bureau to do that. And was, uh, he believed they were, were communists, um, or he said he believed they were communists, and of course they weren't. It certainly went well beyond, beyond Johnson and into the Nixon era. And the, it's a kind of uh, lesson, I think, again for us today, that it's pretty easy to go, as Fritz talked about earlier, uh, from the people who oppose your policy to for, from people who you think may be dangerous to the people who oppose your policy to everybody. Right, and you also made the point in an earlier installment of our series, both of you, that this was not limited to Johnson or to Nixon, but really was all presidents who tried to push the limits of their executive power in this area of intelligence gathering back to FDR. And it is the fact of secrecy that allowed that to happen. And so that's the great tension in uh, intelligence activities that they're supposed to be conducted in secret. And the secret exercise of power is incredibly alluring. And at this point, we will watch, as we promised, 45 minutes of the Church Committee's investigation into FBI uh, informants. This was recorded by NBC cameras on December 2nd, 1975. In previous sessions, we've examined the Bureau's use of mail openings, electronic and other means of surveillance, surreptitious entry, individual and organizational bank records, income tax returns, and other sources of intelligence information. It is clear that under proper judicial scrutiny, as mandated by the Congress and the courts, Limited invasions of individual privacy involving any or all of the foregoing could be properly undertaken in aid of the Bureau's law enforcement mission. The focus of our inquiry has been, and will continue to be, the use of these and other techniques without the sanction of judicial authority and for purposes often unrelated to law enforcement as it has been traditionally defined in our country. I stress that the mandate of this committee is to examine the intelligence gathering activities of governmental agencies and does not in any way encompass an assessment of the overall FBI law enforcement effort. We make no attempt at overall assessment. With respect to those FBI activities, 
which have come to be known as domestic intelligence. Our inquiry has revealed a further bifurcation of the Bureau's areas of concern. As previously discussed by the Committee's Council in our last session, approximately 20 percent of the Bureau's budget is devoted to intelligence activities. This is divided between so-called domestic intelligence and counter-espionage activities. We have accepted and we support the Bureau's position that a further budgetary breakdown detailing the precise expenditures for each category might adversely affect the national interest by revealing the exact amount of expenditures for counter-espionage. Therefore, while the nature and extent of these activities is less than precise from a budgetary standpoint, this inquiry nevertheless represents a critical area of our investigation. Testimony and other evidence received by the committee to date indicates that a variety of techniques, not limited to those just cited, were employed against individuals and organizations without even color of legislative or judicial authority. The impact of those abuses on individuals and on legitimate political, social, religious, and philosophical interests represents a dangerous erosion of our constitutional guarantees. In Council's survey of the, of the issues during our last session, we examined a range of activities extending from information gathering to disruption of the lives of individuals and organizations. We witnessed intelligence functions at their admitted worst in our review of the so-called counterintelligence program against Dr. Martin Luther King. Today, we turn to an in-depth review of intelligence methods through an examination of the Bureau's most widely used technique, informants. The concept of informing is usually distasteful. However, the informant technique is a valid and recognized one in the intelligence field and often leads to very solid results. At issue is the Bureau's abusive employment of this technique, an abuse at least partially due to the absence of clear guidelines concerning intelligence informants and the lack of appropriate constitutional guarantees. The legitimate concern of the FBI in investigating criminal conduct and preventing criminal activities can never justify allowing informants or other law enforcement agents to operate outside the law without regard for the rights of others. When an informant is used to penetrate an organization to provide intelligence information, the possible impact of this influence, of his influence, on the activities of that organization cannot be ignored. Surely the infiltration of informants into groups and organizations which seek to bring about political, social, economic, or other changes in our society represents, at the very least, a chilling effect on the freedom of citizens to gather and to debate and work for such changes. The fact that an informant in carrying out his role may hinder or alter the advancement of legitimate objectives sought by members of organizations is a matter with which we must all be concerned. Furthermore, the Bureau's use of informants in large numbers and in circumstances where the propriety of having an informant is dubious in the first place poses an additional item of concern. As I have already noted, the Bureau's use of the informant is part of the FBI's catalog of technique for carrying out its work. Our hearing today will focus first on the roles actually played by two informants, one who infiltrated the Ku Klux Klan another who infiltrated Vietnam veterans against the war. The first witnesses today will be Mary Jo Cook and Gary Thomas Rowe. Mr. Rowe will be wearing a hood so that he cannot be physically identified. He believes that physical identification would be inimical to his personal safety. He now resides at a location not to be disclosed under an alias. Uh, which has been given to him by the government. Warren, <laughs> please. 
Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give for this committee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth will help you, God? Uh, the witnesses are, are represented by counsel today. Would counsel please identify themselves for the record? Frank, excuse me, Franklin Gerdes for Mr. O. Alan Marshall. You may be seated. The chair now recognizes. Ms. Cook is also represented by Ms. Ann Bonham. Thank you. The chair now recognizes the minority counsel for the committee. Committee's inquiry with examination of Ms. Cook. And Ms. Cook, if you will, I'd like to begin by starting with your first affiliation with the Federal Bureau of Investigation, if you will. It's my understanding that your contact began in the summer of 1973. If you could, just briefly for the committee, explain how that contact came about. Yes. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I was living with a man who... Would you pull your mic a little closer to you? I was living with a man who was working for the Bureau and who had been working for the Bureau for about a couple of months as an informant. He asked me, um, I observed his activities, we discussed his activities, and then he subsequently asked me if I would consider becoming an informant. Uh, he took me Which to... Which group was he informing for? He was informing for the FBI. And who was he informing about? He was informing on the Vietnam Veterans Against the War Winter Soldier Organization. See. Okay. He took me to a meeting. After we returned from the meeting, we discussed in more detail how he felt about being an informant, what he did, why he did it. And when I said that I would be open to talking about being an informant with the FBI, he set up an, a meeting. And then the FBI came to my house to t discuss it with me. An agent came to visit you for the purpose of discussing your becoming an informant? Yes. What was the nature of that discussion? What were you asked? if anything, to do by the FBI. The major understanding that I got from the meeting was that VDAW, WSO was an organization primarily of veterans who were possible victims of manipulation. They had been through the Vietnam War, they had legitimate readjustment needs, and the Bureau was afraid that they could become violent or could become manipulated in a cause or a social concern. And they wanted me to go in there, participate in the organization, and make sure that the veterans didn't get, you know, quote unquote, ripped off. So I was to be, you know, they used words like be a voice of reason, be a big sister, be a, sort of a guiding force in the organization, and keep things calm, cool, and collected. That sounded like a legitimate thing to do, so I agreed to work for the, for the FBI. In addition to maintaining reason and keeping things calm and cool, what other functions any were you assigned by the FBI? Well, this whole scenario that was presented was called what it was being an informant. So I was to go to meetings, um, write up reports or call, phone in reports on what happened, who was there, um, to in some way to try to totally identify the background of every person there, what their, what their relationships were, who they were living with or sleeping with, um, to try to get some, some sense of the local structure and the local relationships among the people in this organization. And so I would go to a meeting, uh, identify the people who were present, identify them as individuals, and then identify the substance of the meeting. You identified the attendees by name? Yes, or by physical description if I didn't know the name. Did you identify friends of persons who were associated with the organization? Yes, I did. Did you provide information on these persons' places of employment? Yes, I did. And you said you provided information on their personal relationships? Yes, I did. How did you come to gain this kind of information? <laughs> Much of the, this information would be, initially, it would be gathered at a meeting. Uh, people would joke in personal conversations. They would drop information about themselves. As I got to know them as, in, as, as personal friends later, then uh, much more information, I had access to much more information. Did you report back to the Bureau all information gained? No, I did not report back to the Bureau all information 
gained. In, initially, when I worked for the Bureau, I did. I've had little way of making... I was alien to the situation. They said, go into this. And so I had no way of really knowing what was important, what wasn't important. So in one sense, I was a vacuum cleaner for information, just gathering it. Um, as I became more familiar with the context within which I was working, I was able to make decisions about what was important information and what was not. Was this on your initiative, or were you given guidance as to what to exclude? This was on my initiative. Did you report information on the political views of these persons? Yes, I did. Ms. Cook, how many people were involved in this reporting back process? How many people did you report on? Well, I figured that there were about 50 core people in the organization in the local chapter in Buffalo. And if you look at it in concentric circles, there's perhaps 250 people in the Buffalo community whose names I identified as being leadership one way or the other in, in social issues that they were active in. And then perhaps 400 people nationally, when you take a look at national VVWSO and all of the organizations that I came into contact with. And then when you add to that the mailing lists that I've turned over and uh, the names that came into my hands, as, as being active or interested members of VVA WWSO, that's perhaps, that may be as many as a thousand names. With respect to the value of what you had given to the Bureau, was there any formal process for identifying what was important as opposed to the, the trivia that may have resulted from your communications with them? The yes, I'm, really what I'm asking is what system, if any, was communicated to you regarding the importance of certain kinds of information? Was it determined on the basis of some guidance by the Bureau? Was it determined based on the, the amount of pay received for information? Was there any system designed to communicate to you what was important? Okay, beyond general guidelines, you know, identifying people who were present and being aware of people with a propensity for violence, there were no guidelines as to what information was was important or wasn't Im important. My financial arrangement with them was on the basis that I would turn over all information gathered. They would look it over. They would decide what was of value to them and what wasn't of value to them, pay me accordingly without necessarily identifying what they considered essential. They rarely gave me information. They rarely, they didn't define my context and then ask me to go into it. They just said, we want you to go in there. We're not gonna tell you anything about it. You figure it out. I figured that was fair. And your pay was based on the Bureau's assessment of the value of the information which you turned over? Yes. How long were you involved in the effort in informing against the Veterans Against the War? From June of 73 through November 74. That's approximately a year and a half. Did there come a time when you were either dissatisfied with or raised questions about your activities as an informant? Yes. When did this occur? This occurred very, very much so after July of 1974. I had come here to Washington and been in the only large demonstration that I've ever been in. The Bureau had asked me not to go. It advised me not to go. I came and I saw people people that I had met in the course of my activities with blood running down their heads. I came back from, from Washington very upset and I started talking with the FBI about, I, about all of the contradictions that I was starting to see. I didn't understand what my involvement was anymore. So I just, I, I started saying to them, I don't see the reason for my continuing. It seems to me that you don't understand what I'm telling you. These people don't need me functioning in their midst. And if you can't give me assurances that the information that I'm giving you, which, are, which you seem to strip a context away from, isn't going to be used against these people, then, then I cannot continue. And they couldn't, they tried to give me assurances. They, they brought someone from Washington to talk to me, and he talked in humanist philosophical terms about why I should continue and how everything was, was, was all fine and good. But I was very dissatisfied with, with those conversations, and I insisted on quitting. I gave them a month's notice, and I quit. This person from Washington who talked to you in philosophical terms, do you recall the substance of that conversation? In this effort to get you to remain as an informant, what kinds of 
reasons were advanced? Mostly, they were trying to assure me that the FBI was part of Our, our conversations were really far-ranging. We discussed all sorts of social issues, from poverty to the space program to ecology. They tried to assure me that things were, were doing fine, the, st the status quo was really fine. I was involved with a group of people who had really bad readjustment needs as veterans who didn't have social programs that were, that were sufficient for them. I was also involved, involved in welfare rights. And I was constantly meeting people who lived with a degree of poverty that, that provoked them and irritated and frust frustrated them, and they turned to self-help programs. So here I have on one hand a man telling me that things are fine and that my work for the Bureau is part of making sure that dissidents who, who somehow, they, they had no sympathy with the poverty and the consequences of that poverty that I was viewing firsthand and, part, and, 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 and living with day to day. So that we were really very much miles apart in our discussions about what was fine and what was not fine in America. And they could not give me the assurances that this information would not be used against people because I, I no longer could trust that their interest in these people, that they were just not sensitive to, to what the real needs of these people were. And was it then shortly after this that your role as an informant was terminated, that you indicated you no longer desired to work in this capacity? Yes. Let me just raise one final area of inquiry with you. In our previous discussion, you indicated that there came a time when you had become involved in the Attica Defense Project representing the Vietnam veterans against the war, and that as a part of such, you had been involved in things like the jury survey effort. Yes. My question is, did you communicate to the Bureau any of your efforts in this regard as they related to the Attica defense effort? Yes, I did. I was put in a position, I was told not to bring to the FBI's attention any information that legally they shouldn't have. But I'm not a lawyer, and most average citizens cannot make decisions about what's legally significant and what's not legally significant. There are many instances where I passed information thinking that I could legitimately pass that information. I now understand that that information, legally the FBI should not have had that information. And I feel badly about that, but I also know that I was put in the kind of position where I was required to make a professional decision, and I could not make a professional decision. Scott, did the information passed include correspondence between you and Attica defendants? Yes. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my examination of witnesses. Yes, it would. From when to when? Sir, from approximately 1959 to 1965. Can you draw the microphone a little closer to you? From approximately 1959 to 1965. Uh, in 1965, did you surface in connection with a murder case? Yes, I did. Uh, whose murder and what role did you play in that case? I was in the automobile the evening the woman, uh, Mrs. Viola Luzio, was killed by a group of Klansmen. And this was a situation in connection with the Selma March where a woman from Detroit was killed uh, while she was riding in a car after the march? That is correct, sir. And you surfaced and testified at three trials, which ultimately resulted in a conviction of the, of the um, persons who had committed that murder. Is that, that right? That is correct. All right. I want to go back, uh, Mr. Rowe, to how you came to that point and what you did as an informant before performing that service. Had you served in the government prior to being a Klan informant in the Amer in military forces? Yes, sir. You'd been a Marine? Yes, sir. How old were you when you became a Marine? Sir, I was joined the Marine Reserves at, 19, at uh, 14 and a half years of age. Uh, and the FBI recruited you to in, infiltrate the Klan, is that right? That is correct, sir. What kind of information did you report back to the FBI about the Klan? Any and everything that I observed or heard pertaining to any Klansman. Now, did that include information relating to planned violence or actual violence? Yes, sir. Uh, did it also include information related to political matters? Yes, sir. What's an example of that? Sir, an example of that was we had uh, 
former FBI agent running for mayor of Birmingham. Uh, I was instructed to attend meetings, uh, observe who was there, whether the uh, people were Republicans or Democrats, if I could best describe that, uh, and give their names, and if they were, in fact, uh, active political voters. Now, in addition to reporting back political information and information relating to violence, did you report back information relating to the social life of the members of the Klan? Yes, I did. Including the most intimate details of their social life and personal life? That's what I was instructed to do, sir. You were instructed to do that by the Bureau and you did that? That is correct, sir. Uh, did you also go to meetings of civil rights organizations and report back what was being said at those meetings? Yes, I did. And did you report the same information to the Bureau and to the Klan about the civil rights organizations? Basically the same information, yes. Uh, you were a member of something called the KBI, or the Klan Bureau of Investigation, is that right? That is correct. So you were in effect informing on the civil rights organizations to both the Bureau and the Klan? That is correct. Turning to the subject of violence, uh, what instructions, if any, were you given at the outset of your employment by the FD FBI with respect to participation in violent activity? Sir, I was instructed under no conditions were asked to participate in any violence whatsoever. Now, did those instructions subsequently change? Yes, they did. Describe the change, would you please? Sir, I was uh, contacted by uh, my contact agent, and he stated to me that he says, quote, he said, I know there's a lot of crap going on that you aren't reporting. He said, I know it's happening, and I don't understand why you don't see it. I said, well, it isn't happening in the open meetings, I can tell you that. I give you every night a written report of my meeting. I said, there's absolutely nothing pertaining to, to violence discussed in these open meetings. However, I see a group that stay after the meeting's over, I see a certain group remain, and they don't come out when we do. The agent stated that I should try to get closer to members of their certain group, find out who they were, and try to get closer to them. And did you do that? Yes, I did. And then did you begin to participate yourself in the violent acts? Yes, I did. Uh, and did you tell the FBI that you were participating in violent acts? Before I participated in the acts, yes, I did. What were some of the acts that you participated in, the violent acts? Sir, the major one was the Birmingham Freedom Riders. Now, I'm going to come to that in a moment. Did you also participate in acts where you beat people with chains at, at um, uh, a certain county fair or Yes, sir. There was a county fair in Bessemer, Alabama. Uh, the FBI, I personally gave the FBI several days' notice, a, a, a good week notice that this was going to occur. Uh, my instructions were, well, to hang in, uh, go and uh, see what happens. Just work, work and, your way in. And did the FBI ever tell you that when you went to these violent occasions, you should stand back and not participate, or did they say you're on your own and do whatever you think is necessary? Sir, they stated to me, quote, he says, we have to, by law, to instruct you that you're not to participate in the violence. However, we know you've got to do this. We know it's something that you've got to do, and we understand. So we need the information. That's the important thing. Get the information. And to get the information, was it necessary, in your judgment, to participate in the violent acts yourself? Some of the information, I think, yes, and some I would say no, sir. Right. In connection with the Freedom Riders incident that you mentioned, uh, did you inform the FBI about planned violence prior to that incident? Sir, I gave the uh, FBI information pertaining to the Freedom Riders assault approximately three weeks before it occurred. And what did you tell them? I stated to them that I had been contacted by a Birmingham City detective who in turn wanted me to meet with a uh, high-ranking officer of the Birmingham Police Department to set a reception for the Freedom Riders. You mean the Birmingham policeman set up the beating of the Freedom Riders, and you told the FBI that? That's correct, sir. And then were they beaten? They were beaten very badly, yes. And did the Birmingham police give you the time that they promised to give you to perform the beating? Yes, sir. We were promised 15 minutes with absolutely no intervention from any police officer whatsoever. Uh, the information was passed on to the Bureau. They, we had our 15 minutes. Approximately 15 minutes after the Freedom Riders uh, were attacked, uh, a police officer ran over to me and stated, God damn it, God damn it, get out of here, get them out of here. Your 15 minutes are up, we're sending the crew in. All right, were any arrests made? Absolutely none, sir. But as a matter of fact, I quit very shortly after working for the Bureau because of this incident. I felt that my exact phrase was, why wasn't something done? There were a, a thousand men at least 
on Mother's Day of the morning of the Freedom Riders, just roaming up and down right in front of City Hall. We had baseball bats, we had clubs, we had chains, we had pistols sticking in our belts. It was just unbelievable. Yeah, but that's a problem with the Birmingham Police Department. What about the FBI? Did you ever discuss with them why they... Sir, Nate, I was told by the FBI, quote, he said, well, who the hell were we going to report it to? He said, the police department was involved in it. The police department helped set it up with you. He said, we are an investigating agency, not an enforcement agency. All we do is gather information. That was my answer. Now, sometime after that, were you told that the FBI had declared war on the Klan and given the name of something called COINTELPRO? That is correct, sir. And what were you told to do under the COINTELPRO program? Sir, under the COINTELPRO program, I had been instructed to disrupt, discredit, or disorganize the Klan organization to the best of my ability. And what things did you do in that connection? I was instructed to uh, give information if I find out who was sleeping with who, if somebody was sleeping with another Klansman's wives or was going with someone, I was to try to pass the word around to the different people so that it caused dissension in their homes and try to break up their homes. I was also instructed to attend uh, church services in the regular church services, see if there were any political activities going on or mentioned in church services as opposed to the Klan meetings. Many Klan meetings were held in churches. Were you also instructed personally yourself to attempt to break up marriages by sleeping with wives of members of the Klan? Yes, I was. My instructions were to try to sleep with as many wives as I could. That was probably the best information we could get. All right, and that's all I have. Order, please. Uh, Mr. Chairman, except then thereafter you did solve, as we started, the Liozzo murder by providing information to the FBI that led to the solution of that crime. Yes, I did pass the information up. The committee will stand in recess for three minutes while we bring forth the other witnesses. Now, your question is what criteria? What, what criteria do you use in the selection of informants? Well, the criteria vary with the needs. Uh, in our uh, cases relating to extremist matters, uh, surely in order to get an informant who can meld into a group which is engaged in a criminal type activities, you're going to have a different set of criteria. Uh, if you're talking about our internal security matters, I think we set rather high standards. We do require that a preliminary uh, inquiry be conducted, which would consist principally of checks of uh, our headquarters indices, our field office indices, checks with other informants who are operating in the same area and with various established sources, such as local police department. Uh, following this, if it would appear that the person uh, is the type who has credibility, can be depended upon to be reliable, we would interview the individual uh, in order to make a uh, determination as to whether or not he would be willing to assist the FBI in discharging its responsibilities in that field. Uh, following that, assuming that the answer was positive, we would conduct a rather in-depth investigation for the purpose of further attempting to establish credibility and reliability. How does the Bureau distinguish between the use of informants for law enforcement as opposed to intelligence collection? Is the guidance any different, or is it the same, or what? Well, Mr. Adams, it was passed on to those who had the responsibility to do something about it. It was not always acted upon, as he indicated. In none of these cases, then, there was adequate evidence of conspiracy to give you jurisdiction to act. The departmental rules at that time, and still do, require departmental approval uh, where you have a conspiracy. Under 241, it takes two or more persons acting together. You can have a mob scene, and you can have blacks and whites uh, belting each other, 
but unless you can show that those that initiated the action acted in concert in a conspiracy, you have no violation. Congress recognized this, and it wasn't until 1968 that they came along and added Section 245 to the Civil Rights Statute, which added punitive measures against an individual. There didn't have to be a conspiracy. But this was a problem that the whole country was grappling with. The President of the United States, Attorney Generals, uh, uh, we were in a situation where we had rank uh, lawlessness taking place. At, uh, as you know from the memorandum we sent you that we sent to the Attorney General, the uh, accomplishments we were able to obtain in preventing violence and in neutralizing the Klan, and that was one of the reasons. What was the Bureau's purpose in, in continuing or urging continued informant surveillance of the Vietnam veterans against the war? Was there a legitimate law enforcement purpose or was the intent to alter uh, political expression? We had information on the Vietnam veterans against the war uh, that indicated that there were subversive groups involved. They were going to North Vietnam, uh, meeting with the communist forces. They were going to Paris, attending meetings paid for and sponsored by the Communist Party, the International Communist Party. Uh, we feel that uh, we had a very uh, valid basis uh, to uh, direct our attention to the VVAW. Um, it started out, of course, with Gus Hall in 1967, uh, who was head of the Communist Party USA, with comments he made. What it finally boiled down to is a situation where it split off into the Revolutionary Union, which was a Maoist group, uh, and the hardline communist group. And at that point, factionalism developed in many of the chapters, and we closed those chapters because there was no longer any intent to follow the national organization. But we had a valid basis for investigating it, and uh, we investigated chapters to determine if there was affiliation and subservience to the national office. Mr. Winall was in, in non-intervening in, in the Roe situation when violence was known. Senator Schweiker, Mr. Adams did address himself to that, and if you have no objections, I'll ask that he All do right. that. Uh, the problem we had at the time was that the F and it's the, the problem today. We're an investigative agency. We do not have police powers even like the United States Marshals do. The Marshals, since about 1795, I guess, or some period like that, have uh, authorities that almost border on what a sheriff has. Uh, we're the investigative agency of the Department of Justice. And during these times, the Department of Justice had us maintain the role of an investigative agency. We were to report on activities. We furnished the information to the local police who had an obligation to act. We furnished it to the Department of Justice. In those areas where the local police did not act, it resulted finally in the Attorney General sending 500 United States Marshals down to guarantee the safety of people who were trying to march in protest of their civil rights. Uh, this was an extraordinary measure because it came at a time of uh, civil rights versus program. Uh, since it's obvious to me that a lot of informers are going to have pre-knowledge of violence of using U.S. Marshals on some kind of a of a, of a long-range basis to prevent violence. We you do. We have them in Boston in connection with the busing incident. We're investigating the violations uh, under the Civil Rights Act, but the marshals are in Boston. They're in Louisville, I believe, at the same time. And this is the approach that the federal government finally recognized uh, was the solution to the problem, where you had to have added federal import. But instead of waiting till it gets to, to, to a Boston state, which is obviously pretty advanced uh, confrontation, uh, Shouldn't we have somewhere a coordinated program that when, uh, when you go up the ladder of command, the FBI, that, that on, on an uh, immediate and fairly uh, uh, contemporary basis that kind of help can be sought instantly as opposed to waiting until it gets to a, a Boston? I realize the departure from the past, I'm not saying it isn't, but my point is, it seems to me we need a better remedy than we have. Well, fortunately, we're at a time where conditions have subsided in the country. Uh, even from the 60s and the 70s and uh, periods like, uh, or 50s and 60s, uh, we report to the Department of Justice on potential 
trouble spots around the country uh, as we learn of them so that the department will be aware of them. The planning for Boston, for instance, took place a year in advance uh, with state officials, city officials, the Department of Justice and the FBI. Our approach, our only approach, was through informants. And uh, through the use of informants, we solved these cases, uh, the ones that were solved. There were some of the bombing cases we'd never solved. They're extremely difficult. But uh, uh, these informants, uh, as we told the Attorney General and as we told the President, uh, that we had moved informants like Mr. Rowe up to the top leadership. He was the bodyguard to the head man. Uh, he was in a position where he could uh, forewarn us of violence, uh, could help us on cases that had transpired, and yet we knew and could see that this could continue forever unless we can create enough disruption that these members will realize that if I go out and murder three civil rights workers, even though the sheriff and other law enforcement officers are in on it, uh, if that were the case, and some of them it was the case, that uh, I will be caught. And that's what we did. And that's why violence stopped was because the Klan was insecure. And just like you say, 20%, they thought 50% of their members ultimately were Klan members. And they didn't dare engage in these acts of violence because they knew they couldn't control the conspiracy any longer. So, uh, Mike. I'm sorry. Well, I'm my time is expired. I just have one quick question. Is it correct that in 1971 we were using around 6,500 informers for a black ghetto uh, uh, situation? I'm not sure if that's the year. We did have one year where we had a number like that, which would have probably been around 6,000. And that was the time of the when the cities were being burned, uh, Detroit. Washington, areas like this, we were given a mandate to know uh, what the situation is, where is violence going to break out uh, next. They weren't informants like uh, uh, a, uh, an individual that's penetrating an organization. They were listening posts in the community that would help tell us that we have a group here that's getting ready to start another firefight or something. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, there are Three more senators rem remaining for questioning. If we can go, if you can try to get everything in in your first round, it may be the best professional organization of its kind in the world. But when the FBI acts in the field of political ideas, it's uh, bungled its job, it's interfered with civil liberties, and finally, in the last uh, month or two, through its public disclosure, has heaped uh, shame upon itself and really led toward uh, an undermining of crucial public confidence in an essential law enforcement agency of this country. And in a real sense, history has repeated itself because it was precisely that problem that led to the creation of the FBI in 1924. In uh, World War I, the Bureau of Investigation strayed from its law enforcement functions. It seems to be the the basis of this strategy that people can't protect themselves from dangerous ideas. That they somehow you need to use the tools of law enforcement to protect people from subversive or dangerous ideas. Which I find strange and quite violent, uh, quite uh, profoundly uh, at odds with the philosophy of American government. I started politics uh, years ago uh, and uh, the first thing we had We've got to control this, restrain it, define it, so that precisely what's expected of the FBI is known by you, by the public, and that you can justify your actions when, when we ask you. I agree with that, Senator, and I'd like to point out that when the Attorney General made his statement, uh, Mr. Hoover subscribed to it, we followed that policy for about 10 years until yes. the President of the United States said we should investigate the Nazi party. I, for one, feel that uh, we should investigate the Nazi party. I feel that uh, our investigation of the Nazi party resulted in the fact that in World War II, as contrasted to World War I, there wasn't one single incident of foreign-directed sabotage which took place in the United States. And under the criminal law, well, you could have investigated 
these issues of sabotage? Isn't sabotage a crime? Sabotage is a crime, but well, yet... Well, can't you investigate it then? After it happens... See, every time you get challenged on, on getting involved in political ideas, you defend yourself on the basis of crimes that you've been investigating. It's very interesting. That's in my opinion, you've got to stand here if you're going to continue what you're now doing, and as I understand it, you still insist you did the right thing with the Vietnam Veterans Against the War and investigating the Council of Churches. So no. this can still go on. This can still go on under your interpretation of your present powers, which you try to justify on the grounds of your law enforcement activities in terms of criminal matters. The law does not say we have to wait until we have been murdered before we can Absolutely. act. Absolutely. That's, and, but that's in the but, field of law again. That's there you right. go again. It's the field of law. You're but trying when, to defend absolute But when you arguments. have sabotage... To that's the law. You that's, can do that. You've got That's right, of. but you can't... How do you find out which of the 20,000 Boone members might have been a saboteur? You don't have probable that's cause correct. to investigate any one, but you direct an intelligence-type right. investigation right. against the German-American Boone. That's correct. The same thing we did after Congress said... And couldn't make, you get a warrant for that? Why do you object to going to a court and asking for authority to because do Because you don't thing. have probable cause to go against an individual. And the law doesn't provide for probable cause to investigate an organization. Uh, there were uh, activities which did take place, uh, like at one time they were going to outlaw the Communist Party, uh, yeah, which didn't we come could, about. We could, what I don't understand is why it wouldn't be better for the FBI for us to define authority that you could use in the kind of bun situation where, under court authority, you could investigate where there's probable cause or reasonable cause to suspect sabotage and the rest, wouldn't that make a lot more sense than just making these decisions on your own? We have expressed complete concurrence in that. We feel that we're going to get beat to death for the next 100 years, right. the damned if you do and damned if you don't, right. if we don't have a delineation of our responsibility in this area. But the hearing... <laughs> You know, the gate's open. You know, do your thing, man. Here, give them some coke. All Charlie's friends get free coke.